Sister Ali, welcome to I Never Knew TV, right? <laughs> glad to have you. Thank you. <laughs> glad to have you, all right? So um, I want to start off and ask, uh, where did you grow up and what were your parents like as parents and husband and wife? Now, you know, when my, I'm not important like that in all my history and everything. Uh, I grew up actually here in Cincinnati and uh, my parents were good people. They were mentally dead. They didn't know the truth. So they taught me what they knew. But I was uh, well taken care of. My father was an engineer and my mother was a, uh, a homemaker in white people's house. Where did the idea come from to create the book, The Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman? And did the wisdom in the book come from literature or just life observations? Well, I got the idea. I had written a book in 1985. Oh, these all seem so long time ago. But anyway, I had written a book called uh, How Not to Eat Pork, A Life Without the Pig. Okay. And I was going around with that, taking a microscope, showing the people how to kind of worm, look in the muscle and the brain. You know, and I was, you know, like I said, I've always been an activist of some kind trying to do something for us. And uh, I noticed that uh, the men were saying, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, you know, I'm going to get with that. Da, da, da. And they were more in agreement. And the sisters were, he going to eat what I cook. I've been cooking it, he been eating it, and my grandma ate it, and she's still here. She ate it. Now, you know, and I said, wait a minute, what's happening here? And that happened a few times. Not a lot of people, but a few times that caught my ear. And I said, now we're withholding the proper food from the black man, and food is what sustains life. What else are we withholding that is affecting his development and success? And so then I started looking at us, which had not been done. Because prior to me writing The Black Man's Guide, and it was released in March of 1990, uh, I wrote it in 1989. But uh, was that uh, we did not want to take too much to any accountability for the condition of our families and the failure of our families and uh, undisciplined children, everything. And because then everything was blamed on the black man. You know, he ain't this. He ain't in the house. He ain't paying this. He not working. He not whatever. With us negating the fact that he was under, you know, you all were under a terrible system. You didn't have anything going. You were still held back by your color, not your ability. And uh, I didn't like that because I had, I had a wonderful husband. And I had uh, great sons as a result of that. And I did not want uh, you all to continue to function without really knowing us like we thought we knew you. Okay? We had support in every negative idea we had about every black man. Okay? And the black man you see now is not the black man of the 50s and 60s and 70s. Okay? Uh, they have... Uh, grafted you all in a way. You all a whole new different people than the kind of men we knew, okay? But at any rate, uh, I wanted to just study us and look at that. And so I got it from uh, traveling, interviewing people, and uh, the foundational principles of what makes success in a relationship. And from myself and just a lot of different, you know, aspects of, of life. I started, you know, gathering that information. It was there all along. The Black Man's Guide is not a surprise. It's just the first time y'all seen it in print. Yeah, ain't no surprises in that. And, and all right, so uh, everything you learn from the book about not eating pork, you apply to this book in regards to marketing, how to get everything done? Well, of course, you know, all of the worlds have a join and on, especially with knowledge. You can, you know, go from one step to the other, lead you to the other. Uh, diet is very important. Diet is the reason that uh, we are overweight, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, high cholesterol, liver disease. Now we're getting a whole thing on kidney disease. You know, a lot of these things we have developed from bad diet. We don't know what we're eating. We're the only people in America who don't have a food chain. And when I say that, I don't mean stores. We don't have a food path. The Asians, 
They have stores. They have food in there that's got their language. We don't even know what's in the can if it ain't no picture of it. They created that. We even have Africans here who have food that they have brought in from the East and from South Africa that they are able to sell here that they manufactured. They brought it in, however. And of course, the Latinos, the Mexicans, all of them have their own food. We can't even, as I say, read a lot of the labels. And so everyone here has a food path except us. Our only food path is to get it from them. Okay, white people even get a lot of their food, you know, out of Italy and a lot of places over there in Europe. But we don't have any place. We don't get along with the Africans and they don't get along with us. They've been taught to hate us and dislike us and think we're a fool. And we've been taught we don't like their attitude. They act like they're superior, you know, because we're walking around talking about we are African Americans. We're not African Americans. We are American Africans. This is how African look that's been uh, indoctrinated with all the nonsense of America. This is how an African looks when they have been robbed of their God, their politics, and their principles. We are a result. This is what it looks like. Okay? I don't realize Muhammad teaches, the first thing it does is dignify you. And it does teach you superiority because you are superior. We don't have to pretend that we're not superior. Certainly the black man. Because by you all accepting that you are less, and they have made it almost illegal. That's one of the things they said against the messenger, is that he teaching racial superiority. Absolutely. They teach it. And if they didn't teach racial superiority, then how come they don't say that Jesus is black or Chinese or Latino? They made him white like them. That's the supreme racial superiority that they tricked us with. Yeah. But the church give us an activity that we think we're doing for God. The church give us something to do. The church give us what the messenger called the imagination of truth. It lets us dream of something when we know good and well what he taught is that nobody's interested in the affairs of man but another man, all right? And he told us that if Jesus or any of the people that they say they believe in came down here, or if an angel, if a human being came down here with wings on their back, and somebody floated down out of the, crowd, the clouds and did any of that, we wouldn't run up to them and say, oh, Lord, we would run away from them, okay? And the white people would try to kill them. They would shoot him. That would be the first thing. Oh, no, we're not having none of that. And they said, you know, so as a, we have been taught to look at things in such a ridiculous way. It's just absurd. Um, since you brought up Christianity, I had a question I want to ask before we get back to the book. Uh, I heard you say, I don't know if it's in the book I heard you in the interview say, you said these preachers or leaders, Christian leaders, are not praying for people, they're praying on them. Can you explain what you meant by that? I don't remember saying that, but I'm sure you paraphrase in some kind of way. Uh, it's like a, <laughs> a lot of the so-called ministers and preachers and different people we got out here, they're not teaching you to worship God, they're teaching you to worship them, Okay. God don't need money in that way. And there has never been a guy recorded that lived in high riches like all of the people that say they represent God do today. It's not a necessity. Okay. In fact, when you really are strong in your faith, you don't even want a lot of material things as proof that you are in contact with God. You know, the blessing is survival. The blessing, the supreme blessing is peace which is something we don't have. We don't have peace. We're not even familiar with it, other than saying peace, or peace and love, and things like that. But as a way of life, as to practice it in our homes and over our children so that we can model a new idea, that's the only way to change the people. You change their idea. You don't have to change their environment. You don't have to charge them nothing. You don't have to join no group. Just change your idea, and the rest of all of you will get in line with that, and you will be successful in whatever that idea is. Now, that idea can be robbing a bank. That idea can be uh, murdering somebody. But if you get in agreement in your mind to do it, it can turn out all kinds of ways. So we should get in agreement in our mind to practice doing things a different way, to raise our children a different way, Stop treating the children like they are a burden, you know, and that they are in the way. And all that talk about the children are the future. Well, we're looking at the future now. Do we like it? 
No, we don't like it. Our children are savage running the streets. We've let them get raised up on all the nonsense on every media that we could afford to buy them. That's not anything we're proud of. They're very ignorant and disrespectful and embarrassing. And most of us are afraid of them because they're so savage. They have no predictability. Uh, I had a high school ask me to come and speak to the seniors because that one book I have, uh, Things Your Parents Should Have Told You, uh, it was required reading in a lot of schools at one time that the children had to read this and understand it before you get your diploma, especially in New York. And so I would uh, look at uh, the condition of the children and recognize that that's, we're looking at the tomorrow. And we don't have an alternate plan. There's a few good brothers out here with some schools now for black boys especially. Okay. We need that. We need them for the girls. And, oh, and that's another thing I want to mention. We need to start letting our little boys play with dolls. Now this is a campaign that I'm trying to get started. They need to play with dolls because we got young men out here and older men that the child interrupt the video game, they knock it out with their fists. They beat them, they kill them, they don't know how to discipline them physically, they go too far, they punching them with their fists. They're doing a lot of things to these babies, taking their frustration out on them and anger out on them because they don't relate to it, they don't know how to deal with it. So we tend to just teach motherhood as if that's all you need, while on the other hand, we're talking about you need the, the father in the home when we don't consider teaching you all fatherhood. There ain't no magic in none of it. We have to be taught everything. And so if we teach the father how to relate to the child and the baby, maybe he'll do a little different. We can't just teach the mother how to be a mother and if the father don't know it. And that slip, I, that got past me too. Why do we think that you all automatically have that? You've been up under the same slave master's grandchildren and great grandchildren and enemy that we have been under. So we have all been affected in our way of thinking. We're not doing things like we used to do them. And so we're not getting that result anymore. It's too many variables. We have allowed too much to get into our children's head. And we have let them see bad models, children cursing their parents out, fighting their parents, doing all of those kind of things. You know, that hasn't worked. And so people say, I'm old school. Now, I'm on the system that worked. The one we got now has not worked, is not working, and will not. We have to be able to have some input into those kind of things. Uh, we got young people now that don't even know personal hygiene. So whose responsibility is it to teach that? That's a big thing. I taught in public school. Yes, yes, years, absolutely. And like people don't acknowledge that kids don't know basic hygiene. The girls or the boys, and they're not taught. You know. No, so. no, and the. Uh, you know, and we have some other sexual things that are going on. You know, life, everything is a trend, okay? And so, and we jump on trends because we don't have no self, and so we can mimic everybody. That's why we do so good in all of them pictures. Will Smith was Muhammad Ali. Jamie Foxx was Ray Charles. You know, we can turn into anybody because there's nothing in there for us to hold on to as a base, okay? That lack of knowledge of self, God, and the devil has left us, you know, we're just, just blind, deaf, and dumb in a sense. Not dumb like stupid. We're the smartest people here. But dumb and not being able to speak or hear or talk about things that make sense and are good plans, okay? And uh, right now, in looking on the internet, you have adult black women shaking their naked behinds to the camera, okay? This is the kind of desperation that we have for the black man who we say we can't get along with, okay? But everything that we do is to attract you. However we dress, however raunchy, whatever it is, is to attract you, okay? Whatever kind of uh, uh, makeup, hair, long hair, fingernails, anything artificial that we add to ourselves is because of our low self-esteem and low value for ourselves and we think we have to have something made by somebody else to adorn ourselves with to get your attention. It all leads back to you. God is a man, all right? And everything leads back to you, even if we're fighting you, okay? We want y'all way more than you want us, 
you all don't, they, we make it seem like it's the opposite way, okay? But oh, the desperation that we live in because of our loneliness and not being able to, to mate, even intellectually. From what I understand, you spoke to Kevin Samuels numerous times and he acknowledged your work as uh, being the inspiration for his views about relationships in our community, right? <laughs> um, did you agree with Kevin Samuels' approach? No, I didn't agree with Kevin Samuels. He agreed with me. And, that's, was, and he was always so respectful to me. And we were getting ready to do something, though. We were going to do a big thing in Atlanta. And then he went and died. So I guess that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, Kevin, uh, the book woke him up, and it gave him the courage to discuss and address these things since I had did it and had put out the blueprint. And so he uh, was a bit crude. Uh, I had told him I didn't think he would be successful because of how he was going about it. But he uh, told it the way he saw it, and uh, he was not successful. He was successful in his platform, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of people, three, four, five hundred thousand people were, you know, tuning in to hear him and his comments. But I don't know. Uh, I'm sure it benefited some of the women because it put us in check about what we think our overrated value is. Okay, and we think we have a greater value because we think that we are in charge of sex. Okay, and most men will just about do anything or go along with anything if they think that. Well, that's changing. <laughs> okay, that uh, is not all completely the way it, uh, it was. This is the thing I wanted to mention, and I don't usually talk about this. When I say that we're living in trends, the messenger talked about when we get out of control, too savage that you live in a beast life, okay? Our younger people, that's that children of the future them, are living somewhat of a beast life because the new trend now, and I only know about this because they put it out there in the public on the Instagram and the internet and on the uh, Facebook and everything. Uh, one of the things that scientists say separates the humans from the animals is that humans mate face to face. Animals mate from the rear. Well, it's popular now that that's what they're all doing, mating from the rear and doing all kind of other distasteful things and calling it sex. That's a bad sign. Okay. Uh, there's a different connection, as we all know, of face to face than another kind of way. People are getting hurt. Uh, they're choking each other. They're spitting in each other's mouth, doing all kinds of things that would never, ever have been considered as sexual pleasure. There's something wrong in that. I don't know how long they're going to be practicing that. And they're even uh, doing uh, oral sex in people's uh, anus and their hands, all kind of stuff, crazy stuff. And I'm talking about it because we need to know and we need to start trying to teach something differently, okay? That's not no love, that's not no showing of love, it's, uh, it, that's something crazy. And uh, the girls are accepting it, the young women are being choked, or somebody spitting in their mouth, uh, all kind of insanity things, and they calling it sex, that ain't no sex, I don't know what kind of beast life that is, but that's another trend that I hope passes, because that's taking it to such a low level. Where can it go after that? And, and how long then will generations think that that's affection? So that's a very bad sign, I think, and that the young women think that that's natural, as I said, that they're going along with this, and that the men are tiring really of them at all. They don't even want to look at them. And... Uh, I'm concerned about that, and I think we all should be. I just wanted to touch on this, the Kevin Samuels thing one more time. Do you believe he helped bring interest into your works with a new generation? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it just, uh, it was so personally, individually critical. I don't think that that ever helps. I think you have to be civilized in your asking and telling. And I don't think that... Uh, that kind of overly critical 
criticism of an individual, each person individually, no, that does not help, especially publicly. As I said, we already got low self-esteem. And that don't mean build us up on some false bravado. I don't mean that. But I mean, we just have to be more gentle with each other. We are damaged creatures. Let me uh, reword it. I apologize. I, was, I wanted to ask, do you think his work brought more attention to your book? With a new generation, with a younger generation that probably didn't know about I'm not sure. See, the other thing is, remember, we're in a society where they're teaching against reading. All right, everybody either want to hear it or see it. So reading is not as popular. So I'm not sure if it worked that way. Uh, my sales have been impacted on a lot of things. You know, that must be 50 books out called A Black Man's Guide and A Black Woman's Guide. You know, so many people have copied, you know, my title. Um, so I'm not sure it, it worked that way. I'm still selling books and he's still, I'm sure, there's still brothers out there not trying to take his place. So, uh, that that's just you know the way that turned out uh he got me i think more attention for me toward me as a writer as a sister you know but uh i know my place in the world and i'm just a woman that's not an insult that's not a put down but i am not a man see god is a man you represent god and i tell black women the closest you may ever get to god is being with a black man because he looks more like you than me. And uh, we have so many things out here affecting our respect and image of self. That's the other reason black women don't want to believe that the black man is God, because they think the black man they know ain't nothing, and that y'all ain't nothing, so there ain't no way you could be God. In fact, you have some brothers who have surrendered, and they walking around talking about the black woman is God. Some more absurd, silly nonsense when did that, that we start? waste our time on. When did that start? This notion that the black woman was God. Well, they just sur have surrendered. It can't be me because I can't do nothing. I ain't got nothing and look like she more successful or whatever. And so we just decide then she must be God. <laughs> That's what a man do. I don't know no man that would decide that. And I try to correct every brother I run into about that. They think they compliment me by saying the black woman is God. But I'm not God. And I don't want that job. Okay, I got enough to do. I don't want to be, I don't want that responsibility and I don't have that power. I, I wanted to touch on, before we get to the last two questions, I want to touch on something you said where you said uh, black women, they don't see much in black men, right? Mm -hmm. And from personal experience, what I noticed that even if you're, a, I don't know these terms they use, highly performing, even if you're just a, a great guy, right? Mm -hmm. They still can't see the greatness in you. They still what? They still struggle to see the greatness in you if you're oh, a great yeah. person. Oh, yeah. Well, as I said, that's we've been all taught against each other so hard. We have to talk more. Now, that's one thing Kevin did. He got more black men speaking out about their dissatisfaction. Well, dissatisfaction produced change. One of the changes has been more of our men are going offshore seeking other women who they say can know how to act more like a woman. All right? It's like we'll tell a man, everything you do, why don't you act like a man? When you all have never challenged our womanhood, you all have never told us, why don't you act like a woman? It's not in you. But we'll tell you real quick, why don't you act like a man? Well, how do we know what a man act like? Most of us didn't have a father. We didn't have a model. We only saw fathers on television and in movies. And they gave us certain ideas that white people have that they themselves don't live up to. Their fatherhood is built on them being able to provide. And they kept you from being able to do that so that you could not have that. And that's another reason I say that we have to teach our men how to be fathers, how to deal with babies, how to change a diaper, how to do all of those things. You made that. That's your idea. So you need to be a part of how it's going to be reared and how to handle it. Many of our brothers now ending up with their children. Because many of our women, sometimes they have them, and then after, you know, five or six years, they decide, I don't want to be no parent no more. And so they're giving the child away to the father. And then sometimes the fathers are trying to get their children, and you all have a very difficult time because the enemy don't want you to be able to do that, be involved with that, uh, because they are so used to pretending that they're on our side. They're not on our side. The white woman is not on our side because we also think that she's nicer, it's better to deal with her. That's his mother. 
she not on our side. I was gonna ask. That's uh, his mama. Uh, there is the idea of floating around, uh, guys. I know interracial dating for numerous reasons. So I'm not saying every black man with a black a white woman has a uh, views the white woman as superior. I don't want to say that. I don't know if that's the case. So I won't say that publicly, right? But there is an the idea circulating that white women are nicer than black women. Well, they are, because they haven't gone through what we have. They don't have the history we have. Why shouldn't she be nice? I remember one time I was in New Orleans doing a program, and we came out of this restaurant, and there was a white woman sitting on the curb, middle-aged white woman, and she was begging for change and everything. I said, I'm not giving you nothing. You a white woman, you got everything at your disposal that you could have in this country, and you sitting out here begging, and I told my party, don't give her nothing. I said, y'all just need to get up and go somewhere and clean yourself up and be white, and you'll you know, you get something going, all right? If not, if one of these stupid Negroes will get with you, but you gotta clean up and do better than that. I said, but you know, so she has certainly a better opportunity. Now, a lower class white woman is not gonna agree with that. She thinks she's having it as hard as black people. <laughs> In fact, she think we the reason she having it hard, all right? But uh, it's really not like that. Uh, that white privilege that they talk about is real. That's very real. And uh, we practice a little of it with each other on the lighter skins and the darker skins. You know, we ate, every idea they fed us, uh, uh, we ate it. Even though it was all against self, they taught us to want that. And we still continuing to do that now. Uh, we have learned to practice the technology they practice, and so we have distrust of each other. You know, you're gonna trick me or I'm gonna trick you. Just all kind of nonsense that we cannot dig up out of it until we give them their God back. We can't do it. <coughs> it's just impossible. You can't hold on to everything that they stand for and then say you're gonna make a change because everything that they stand for is designed to destroy us. And using our standards based on their standards, I think is also a because big They're not the same. They're not the same. Your nature's not the same as his. We keep pretending that they're human and have the natural feelings of sympathy and everything. They don't have none of that. It's not in them. You have it in you. Nobody never saved nobody but you. And uh, you have been beat down so and so discouraged that it's very difficult. But I want you to know that you will be the winner. You are the original man. God didn't make everybody and then make you. He made you first, and everybody was modeled after you on some level. Uh -huh. That's real talk. That ain't to soothe your ego. I mean, these are actual facts that if we could get our men to understand and accept, and I know it don't look like it now. I know some of the guys in the gutter. I know some of them in prison, some of them on drugs. Some of them out here acting ignorant. Some of them pretending to be a woman. But that does not change the foundation of who you are and who made you, who is on your side, and who will pay the enemy back for what he has done to us. You were saying that um, one of the greatest threats to black women is loneliness. Yeah. Right? Can you elaborate on that more? Well, once again, you're paraphrasing me, but Par yes. <laughs> paraphrasing. Because, you know, I tell you, I have to say that. Paraphrasing. Because people go around saying I said all kind of things, and, and I didn't say, didn't say that, but it was that. something similar to that, okay? Yeah. Uh, well, because we are, we can survive without a man. We do, all the time, all over the country, for years. We can survive without uh, sexual intimacy. We can survive. We can make it, all right? But we're not satisfied, okay? I'm not gonna say happy, because the word happy is not in the Bible, the Torah, or the Quran, so it can't be that important. We, we, they've made it important to us because we spend money for happiness, all right? And we think it's uh, everybody uh, pick out what they want to have happiness, all right? But uh, as I said, peace is the number one thing that creates happiness and allows all of the other things to, to grow and happen. But uh, we're very lonely because of our men being so discouraged right now, okay? Uh, some of our best brothers are in prison, okay? They get a different education there, and uh, 
We are struggling, of course, with the mental health issues that has been forced on you by living in a hostile environment your entire life, okay? A personal rejection is very, very, that's hard to handle over the years, you know. Many of you have been rejected by your father. Some of you have been rejected even by your mother and the entire society. That's very hard and we don't consider that. Now I know right now it looks like we're having a harder time, but we ain't never had as hard a time as you because the enemy has always tried to take your place and make you look inadequate by giving us everything we need for us and our children to survive. So I looked at the television the other night and that new guy, that uh, Swarma Harmony, whatever his name is, that's running in the election, a Republican, he said that uh, many of our women keep the man out of the home so that we can get certain benefits. I'm paraphrasing him, but that's what he said. And that is such a great lie. It was the white man's idea to put y'all out of the house. That wasn't our idea. We tried to keep you in there. We would hide you under the bed, in the closet, anywhere. We weren't trying to separate from you. Plus, if you got a whole project area with a lot of women and children, where did they think them children came from, okay? There's some men in and out there some kind of way. So, you know, this is a lie that they perpetrate. Now they're going to turn it back on us. This is how it's done, all right? The, uh, the entire objective is to keep you and me apart. Whatever the risk is, whatever the cost is, they would rather deal with that than allow us to get together. You know, when I was young, they used to say that mafia stood for mothers and fathers and association. I don't know if that's true, but it makes sense, all right? Because you can always do better with a helpmate. You can do better with peace. All right? uh, that's the greatest inspiration. All right? I, I know how it affects myself. As I've written books over the years, I couldn't do them if anything else was going on. If I was waiting to pay my taxes or if I had to uh, go to a doctor appointment or something at the school, I could not do anything until completely everything was out of my head, everything calmed down where I was at peace and I could, and then the ideas could come in. And creativity is like that. As I said, I, I know that it's like that because it just come into you and then you have to get it out of you no matter what it is. You know, we are creative like that. We, we are just, as an example, the white art museums. There's nothing but nonsense in there. We know it's still pure silliness. That art they talk about as art makes no sense. Their paintings are all, if it'll be maybe exactly like something. Now they like that realism because then they don't have to create nothing, just paint the apple and there it is and it's already an apple there, you know. But uh, it comes up out of you. You don't have to have that kind of inspiration. If you can get cooled out, it, comes, it bothers you so long until you have to get it out. This is what creativity, this is how greatness works for us. And so many of us are so talented, so great, so wonderful. And you know, we're different. We really are. Because you can see the way many of us wear our hair, the way many of us have a certain kind of nose, the way many of us wear certain jewelry, that's all different tribes. We wasn't one tribe that came to America. And so we have those things still in us. And we try to express them, even with the long hair. And I know that's, you know, that, that's not the best thing we need to do is to put all that different uh, fake stuff in our hair. But who has been the model of beauty for the black woman in America? Who has been the model for hair? for the black woman in America, the white woman. So we want our hair like hers. We want to mimic that. That was our model. And we don't, uh, we want to make it black colored hair. But then too, you know, we got slews of black women who have blonde hair, who are getting skin lightness. The self-hate we have been taught, uh, you almost can't, 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 how you quantify that? Okay, and the more false stuff we have on, the more we hate ourselves. That's what that shows. You even got the brothers now getting weaves and getting braids and everything. It's, it's, we are not making the kind of progress we think we are. What do you say to people who always say we are making progress? People would love to say that. We're making progress. 
race is no longer an issue. People are doing great. What is no longer an issue? People say people say race is no longer. Oh, that's crazy! That's ridiculous. I know race you, is I know no you longer heard that an one. issue. Race is the only issue, and everything else uh, just is lined up after that. But I have talked with people uh, who have a similar idea that things are so much better now. Well, it depends on what kind of equation you're setting up. If you're saying that they're not coming to our door at night, pulling us out, lynching us, they don't do that as much. They still do it. They just call it the police and that it's legal. These things are still happening. As I say, we're living in a hostile environment. And a friend of mine once told me, we're trying to normalize our captivity. We're trying to act like it's okay. It's okay. I'm all right. Everything's fine. I got a job. I got an apartment. I got a car. You know, I'm going on vacation. We having a family reunion. What, to celebrate your slave master's name? We can't say that a name is not important. If it hadn't been important, they wouldn't have took it from us. Everything was geared to control us and turn us into a slave for them. When did you change your name and how liberating was it? Uh, my first husband, Brother Solomon, named me, and that was in uh, 1967. He said, Sherry Zine, and I turned around, okay? He said, that's you. And uh, as the history turned out, as we studied it, uh, Sharizad really means tranquility. Now, I know y'all don't think I'm tranquil, but I am. I really am. And uh, she was the one that wrote the stories. Okay, and at that time, at first I was trying to be a poet, incidentally. Okay, because it's a good way to express you. I advise anybody that wants to do some write the poetry, but don't try to make everybody else enjoy it. You just write it for yourself. It's the way to purge. And, uh, I sent my poetry to the messenger, to the Arnold Elijah Muhammad, who was responsible for my career, me writing all my books and everything. I sent it to him. I was so proud. I sent him about two poems. <laughs> he sent me, at that time, you could write to the messenger. He would answer your questions and send you a letter back. How did that make you feel when he responded? Oh, it was just wonderful. Oh, I was just trembling. Of course, I can't find the letter. I was showing it to somebody about 20 years ago, and it disappeared. But at any rate, he wrote me back one line in the letter. He said, Dear Sister Sharazai, I am not concerned with poetry. That was the last poem I wrote. That was the end of that. Oh, I was so embarrassed to myself. You know, and that's in one of our prayers. And that should be in some of uh, the, uh, all of our people's prayers. We have one line in there that says, I have been greatly unjust to myself. So when we are doing evil, when we are doing something bad, oh, it may look like physically that we're doing it to that person or some other organization, but you're really doing that to yourself. You don't have to believe in God because God believes in you. Okay? And uh, uh, <coughs> that's, we practice certain kinds of evil in private and in public, and we make excuses for doing it. And we are just being greatly unjust to ourselves. Yeah. But back to the, to the poetry. So I didn't write another poem. And then over the years, I decided to do other writing. And that's how I started writing books. Did you ever try shopping the book around the publishers? Oh, yeah. I sent a, well, with How Not to Eat Pork, I sent it out to about 100 different publishers. And they all told me no. See, at the time that I wrote a book, your book was not considered authentic unless a publisher had enough confidence in you to publish your book. Self-publishing was down. Nobody wanted to do it, and they wouldn't recognize your book in a bookstore. You couldn't sell it to them. I mean, this is how it was. Y'all wasn't around. You don't remember. But that's the way it was. You couldn't do a book. And so finally, one publisher said that they would do my book. But the book, of course, they were a white big publisher, and How Not to Eat Pork. But the book wasn't but $6 then or $5 or something. And they were going to give me like 50 cents a book. I say, well, then who get the other 5 dollars and 50 cents? You know, if I'm only going to get 10%, 50 cents per book, and they was going to get 550. The devil told me, he said, well, we're going to publish the book. We're going to get your copyright. We're going to get your ISBN number. And uh, we're going to get your Library of Congress number. I wrote down everything he said. <laughs> I went back to school and studied how to be a publisher. And so then I started paying the printer 50 cents, and I got the 550. I was able to mathematically turn that around, 
okay? And that got me into publishing because I recognized, uh, uh, and I am, so we can have it on the record, the mother of the black book explosion of the 90s, okay? You can go into any bookstore, any library, and find any black book written by anybody because the market is flooded and they were all writing. And uh, all of them will be predated before 1989. And that's not to brag, that's just to set the history straight. The history Since straight. the people in the publishing business here in America, most of them ignore me because, not because my books are not interesting and good, but because of my topics. They do not accept that because it affects them too. You know, I'm not talking about y'all, I'm talking about us. All right, and so uh, that's how I, uh, I decided to do my own and become my own publisher, my own publishing company. And of course, it took about four or five years for the publishing industry to catch up on it. Because at that time, of course, the saying was, and it probably still is, that if you want to hide something from a black person, put it in a book. Remember that? You know. And so they, uh, I proved that wrong because black men across the entire country and all the prisons and all the everything were reading the black man's guide. So I really uncovered a market that I had tried to design to set us up in different businesses, which it did. Hundreds of black bookstores opened up just selling one book sometimes, my ask, book. How did it spread across the country? Did you have to go places? Was it just word of mouth? Were you buying advertising? A lot of it was word of mouth. Uh, bookstores have, you know, their own group too, like every other organ uh, business. And so they would tell each other. And I put it in New York first. See, because if you can take New York, you can take anything. Okay. And then I went and appeared at a, what's that stage they have up there? Showtime at the Apollo. Apollo. Okay. They had a radio show with Gary Bird up in the daytime. And so people started driving up in their cars, parking anywhere to come into the auditorium to hear me talking about what I was talking about, you know. So then it started to explode from that. Uh, I didn't take my book to white people. They came to me and said, uh, what is going on? Because we were doing something that they were not involved in and weren't in charge of. Did nobody get paid off of my book when it came out but UPS? Yeah. I had a black printer. I had black people working in my office. You know, my black uh, accountant, everything was black. The only people that was white in my business was UPS because they had to ship the books to all the different places. Where did your oratory skills come from? From the teachings of Aaron Elijah Muhammad. Although in high school, now I was speaking then too, so I had that in me. I didn't know where it came from because I hadn't been around anybody that I had heard, you know, ever uh, uh, talk and other than say maybe the preacher or something, you know. And uh, my mother was not an avid churchgoer, so we didn't go that much anyway. But uh, I hadn't heard a lot of people talking in that way of getting up, speaking too much. But uh, I was attracted to it because in, in high school, I was writing plays. If we had a school play, so you've been doing. I this. would write the, uh, the, the dramatic play or the comedy. I was writing a lot of comedies. So I was doing some stuff like that. But I, I, wasn't, I didn't know where it would lead. I guess you don't know, you know when you start out. But I know I liked books. I would go to the library. And I would walk down the roads touching every book. I was not just intrigued with the writing of a book. I was intrigued with the physical components of the book, the cover, the spine, the different things. And I would touch the pages. And I recognized very early on that a book is a canvas. And I didn't have to do it like they did it. And so my books got all kind of drawings and pictures and all kind of stuff in them because I could put Anybody can. You can put anything you want to put on every page. Give it that flavor. They don't set the standard. They didn't write no first books. All right. What was the process like getting on talk shows in the 90s? Uh, not the, 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 uh, I'm not telling y'all all of that. Yeah. No, I'm not going to tell y'all all of that. So y'all can go harass everybody trying to get on their show. Nah. <laughs> all right. Nigga, all right <laughs> That's nigga. my marketing information. <laughs> all right. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> well, we have been taught that. It's like people that don't have shoes. Uh, they'll say, I don't like shoes, <laughs> you know, cause they don't have no shoes, you know, uh, you know, ooh, I don't like jewelry because they don't have any jewelry. So all of that, I don't need no man, I don't want no man, is because we don't have no man, okay? And uh, it's hard for us not to have a man because we try everything 
that we can think of. We wear anything that we can think of. We'll do anything that we can think of to get a man. So those of us who don't have a man, we just have either exhausted all of our ideas or we have just decided I'm not doing that just to get no man or whatever, okay? But we all want a man. We all want a man and most of us all want at least one baby. Those are things that, that we do want. And we still are laboring under the misinformation that if we can get a man to get us pregnant, that we'll have some kind of hold on him to control him. And that idea has never worked, but we still keep trying it. That's what I don't understand. Like people have observed what goes on in our culture, right? But a lot of women still have this idea like they're going to trap a man with a kid. Yeah, yeah, we do. And it's really, as I said, that's one of the reasons men have to be taught fatherhood too. Because the system that we have practiced in this country is that when you quit the woman, you quit the children too. Okay? And because the uh, rules of uh, child support, you know, are so damaging to uh, uh, our men. If, uh, uh, as an example, if a man is making $2,000 a month, take home pay, that's realistic. Right here today. Okay? And if his child support, if he got two or three children, or two, one, whatever, it's his child support is five or six hundred dollars a month, and his rent is a thousand dollars a month. See, so it's a non-sustainable system if we want our men to be involved in their children's lives, because our men use a lot of excuses not to pay, even a little bit. Some of our men buy clothes and stuff and they think that's child support. Uh, some of our men uh, just completely disappear. Some of them won't work at all because they know if they work, they're gonna have to pay that money for child support. So that is one of the ways that we kind of get you back because there are other ways to do that that would keep you out of the system and you all would be able to co-parent. However, we need teachings on how to co-parent. I was gonna ask you that. Go we ahead. don't know how to do that. We don't know how to cohabit with each other, <laughs> okay? So we don't know how to co-parent. Anything that's co means unity. We don't know how to practice none of that, okay? So we need to have teachers or somebody that come up with some kind of program or brochure or something about how to co-parent without the enemy in the middle of it. Would you be able to provide any advice to anyone in regards to co-parenting? Because people seem to just... um that anger they have for the other person blinds yes. them in regards to what's important yeah, for the child. Yeah, yeah, we'll punish you with the baby. And as I said, you know, I've, I've said this years ago and it created a new dialogue about it, that if we mad with you, we won't even let you see the baby. If you don't give us money, we won't even let you see your own child. That's not punishing you because you going on about your business. It's punishing the child. That's who's being robbed in the situation. And as an example, I've noticed a trend that when you hear the white women getting pregnant on television and so forth, they'll say, we're pregnant. I've even heard their men say, we're pregnant, okay? We say, where's my son? Where's my daughter? Okay? And uh, I know we're real tough, but uh, we can't have no baby by ourselves. They're just not going <laughs> to. It has never flown in that way. So I think that that's something that we could sit down and just talk about it. I know we're mad, but we got to do this different or write it to the person. And uh, we especially get angry if you get it with another woman because we'll say, I don't want my child around your other woman. Well, you are more capable to protect a child than we are. You could protect your child better from a woman than we can protect ours from a man. You know, and it, it, you have to look out for the daughters and the sons now. It's not just a... Uh, uh, that's what I learned just, from just teaching. Just little girls anymore because the situation has gotten just so perverted out here. And our men also don't have the discipline to uh, not be dealing with uh, young girls. Okay. But how many behinds can you look at? And that turn you on. And so what happens is that our men sometimes, I know I'm talking a lot of different things, but this is important too. A lot of our men are going after the younger, younger girls because she stimulates him more than another sister with her butt out. It's, it's just enough. And uh, every, you know, every market can get saturated. Okay. Uh, the crack market 
and what that did to our people. And even now in our schools, we are dealing with the children, great grandchildren and great great grandchildren of the crackheads of the 80s and 70s. Okay, and our children, maybe who we have tried to raise up in a more normal environment, are out here trying to mate with these, these people that's crazy, emotionally blown, a lot of things. And so uh, that's a problem we're dealing with too that we're not addressing. We're acting like that this just, you know, we didn't study that because they didn't care about us enough to study that. And if it had been their children, they'd have studied that. What is the connection 40 years later to what happened there? You know, these are the people that don't want us to deal with our history. But all they talk about is, uh, remember the Alamo, you know, remember Pearl Harbor, remember 911. I mean, they want to remember everything. They have a history and they teach it to their children. And unfortunately, they teach it to ours. Another topic I want to touch on is um, this idea that if the woman earns more than the man, she should be the head of the household and make decisions in the household. How detrimental is that? Oh, of course that's a problem because we have been a, you know, trained and taught that money is God. You know, we respect people more if they have a lot of money. They special. Regardless of how they got the money or the yeah, character. Yeah, yeah, it don't matter. Mm -mm. If they got a lot of money, we, you know, we'll cater to them. In fact, you get more gifts and stuff with money than if you don't have no money because people want to give something to somebody, you know. They, this is, seems to be the way it is. I used to travel sometime and I would have to pack a separate, my staff would put a separate box for all the gifts the people in the audience would bring me. You know, that's uh, uh, how we uh, train, you know, that you are what you own. Not how you act or what you do, uh, you know, how supportive you are. Uh, just whatever you got. That makes you greater and above the people. And uh, that's not good, but we practice, you know, the big eye and the little you. The messenger said that, that the, in Islam, and it wasn't supposed to be no big eyes and little yous. You're supposed to have equality. Do you feel like, uh, how would I say this? How would people restructure not restructuring the home, but restructuring their mind frame to understand that despite certain men's inability to make as much as women, they still can lead a household. Well, there'd be so many other layers of that you'd have to correct, you know, because uh, men have historically sometimes treated us kind of funny if they was the major bed winner. And so we think that that's the pattern. That's what's been modeled for us, and so we're supposed to do that. And so we behave, but that would have to be a discussion that came up way before then. Because sometimes uh, some of them, uh, you know, them leaf raking and boot dusting jobs are gone pretty much. And so if a person has one of them big jobs, you know, you don't have the kind of security that people once used to think they had on a big paying job. Uh, you could be let go because so much of it is technical now in, in, a, in a month, in a day, in a week. And your whole lifestyle change because we, want to adorn ourselves with the material things that we don't make, we don't get no profit off of it, but we want to adorn ourselves with those things that say, look at me, I'm rich, I'm successful, look what I got. Okay. Many of us have houses way bigger than what we need. That, you know, that money, we got uh, over half a million black children in foster care. Who need help? Who need support? We got several brothers out there now trying to have schools, trying to work with these black boys and the black girls. They need help. Yeah, you know, we have a, a, and I'm not telling nobody to give away everything they got or not to like nice things, but we didn't know there was things that was called nice until they showed them to us because we don't have nothing. Every school we got is financed by them. Every college we got is financed by them. We don't have nothing compared to a time when we didn't have nearly the kind of money that we got now when we had our own schools. We had our own railroads, our own law schools. 
We had our own cemeteries. We had our own stores and service centers and all of those things. And I'm not saying we have to reproduce that now because white people have made it through their chains of different uh, businesses that is simpler to go to them. All of it leads back to that we have to do the work for ourselves. And there's nothing that's going to, and I'm going to tell you what we're getting ready to see. All of those people that came, that's coming over here now, the immigrants and so forth, just like a lot of the Asians and Latinos and other people have already done, they come here and in a couple of years they're opening up a business. See, it's not in a, in a vacuum that everybody know how to do something for themselves but us. That was intentional. And it's passed down each generation. Uh, uh, when our men start working, you know, we used to work at the post office and be a nurse and work at General Motors. Well, those were big time jobs for us to get the things that they told us was important. And that we liked shiny things, new things. It would take a special groups. Uh, the stores that say we had in Chicago, which they call headquarters where the messenger was, we didn't, uh, uh, the nation of Islam that we have today and all those other different little nations of Islam and Muhammad's temples around the country, they don't have 10% of what the messenger taught us to do in Chicago and in other cities. You had blocks and blocks of Muslim businesses, people trying to do something for themselves that they could control. They knew they had to get up in the morning. They didn't really need Nobody to tell them, get up before you be late. When you talk about your job, you don't have to say, yeah, my boss, because you the boss. You know, all of those things. Uh, they, that hasn't been re rebuilt. There's a lot of people there, so where's the, where the donations going? Where's the money at? What do we have to show for the money? I'm not talking about no big cars for whoever the leader say he is. I'm not talking about big vacations. I'm not talking about all those things. But what do we have to show for what we pay? Everywhere. What do we have to show? Uh, all of us can't go into the incense business. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we can't all sell shea butter. There are a lot of other things, services that we use. Yeah? But because they, they took that drive out of us, we don't want to do that. We think it's too far away. And there's people still starting, Ava and them, started in the basement of their house. People are still doing that on different things. You know, I didn't have anything but a typewriter and a ream of paper. But you had that fire and you had the teachers. But if you have an idea and you have the drive and you want to do that, you can do that. The missionary didn't give us nothing to do that's impossible. Okay. And uh, he didn't teach us that you're going to die and come back alive, and that one day you're going to see your loved one. No, you're not. I understand that that's easier to believe. One day I'll see you again. We'll be together. No, you're not. Death is the end. The messenger said the only way to avoid death is not to be born. Because if you're born, you're going to die, and you're going back to the earth where everything else came from. Everything that's up here, where we're around, everything in here, it's just a higher or lower form of life from the earth. That's hard to accept. Because I said it's easy to say one day we'll be together. And well, we don't teach that kind of nonsense. We do not believe in no life after death. Even though it sounds, you know, that's once again some more of that imagination of truth. That's not true. That's not an insult to anybody. It just is not an actual fact. In your books, interviews, and lectures, you have spoken very highly of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, do you believe the movie Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad's lack of charisma is the reason he does not get the acknowledgement for the great work he did? Uh, I have to see how to answer that. No. Uh, one of the problems that we have as a people and I have this when I travel around this country and outside the country, is that we want knowledge to be entertaining because that's how we've been trained in this country. Remember, one of the first things they had us do was sports and entertainment. 
And so that's what we want in order to sometimes accept certain information. Uh, we want people to wear a certain type of clothes. Uh, we want them to, you know, have their hair a certain way, and we want them to sound a certain way, and all of these things, and look a certain way. And so I don't think uh, that the problem, if you're asking about, that Malcolm had, okay? No, I was saying with the movie, because in the movie, they the part that they show for a lot, I always wa wa wondered about this. In the movie Malcolm X, right? When it came to well, now that Muhammad. was a docudrama, brother. Yeah, that yeah. wasn't history. <laughs> that wasn't the truth. No, I was saying, do you yeah. think that hurt his image? Because they just they didn't sh they didn't highlight the work that he did. They more focused as on being a jealous person. They didn't well, yeah, well, yeah. you know, that's uh, that's not true. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad didn't have any reason to be jealous of any of us, and he made Malcolm Muhammad Ali. Khalid Muhammad, Louis Farrakhan, and Sherazad Ali. Okay, we are the people that our people admire and respect, even though they don't accept what we believe. All right, and since our Elijah Muhammad gave us something to talk about and taught us how to be free to talk and to tell the truth about our history and things here, uh, people think that that means that uh, his charisma or his lack of charisma, those of us who believed his teachings, we didn't look at him in that same way, okay? But as I said, because most of us have been trained the, for knowledge to come to us as entertainment, that's how we feel. Uh, he taught Malcolm and Minister Farrakhan, all of us, to be fabulous talkers. Back in the day, it used to be called rappers, believe it or not, <laughs> okay? They say he can rap. In fact, we had Rap Brown, you know, and everything, because we could talk and we had things to say. We had information that the majority of our people didn't have. But uh, Malcolm, like most of us, you know, he had uh, Lena Horn, Red Fox, Sam Cooke, all of them were whispering in his ear, get rid of the old man, you don't need him, you could be great on your own. But he was the teacher. And that's what knowledge, great knowledge does, the supreme wisdom. It makes us think because the people admire it so much, it makes us start to think that we came up with that idea and that information and that it is actually ours. And so they were telling Malcolm things and pumping him up on certain ideas that he could be independent and greater than the Arm Elijah Muhammad or the teachings of the Arm Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm had very low self-esteem. And so he... Uh, his wife was uh, not good to him. She uh, had uh, put certain charges on him just in their private life, and he would write to Elijah Muhammad about those issues. And there are some letters floating around out there now about his problems with his wife and him not being able to understand certain things in relationships. He, he was no different than the rest of us. He was a great speaker. I'll never take that from him. Muhammad Ali was a great speaker, you know, and, uh, but he gave us some knowledge to talk about. As I said, we didn't have nothing to talk about, which is why most of my people don't have nothing to talk about. What was your first exposure to Elijah Muhammad? Uh, <laughs> oh, this is going back. Y'all probably weren't even born. Back in 1966, <laughs> uh, I was, dealing with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, I was dealing in a, a different organizations, the Panthers. I was checking out things. I was trying to find myself because that was an exciting time. You know, the black people were finding out we were black and we were wearing our hair certain ways and dressing in certain colors and certain styles. And so I was out there too, trying to find myself because I had always been a creative person. And uh, I had started going around checking out different things. And then one day, a uh, sister, a friend of mine, uh, invited me to the temple. And so when I went in there, the first thing I saw was just all of them big fine brothers sitting <laughs> at the FOI, the Fruit of Islam. And I saw all of them. And uh, I listened to the minister there, who's the minister, David Bacha here in Cincinnati, number five, that's where I came in. And uh, it just rang in my head, in my ear. I said, oh yeah, that's it, right, right. And I found myself agreeing with the information he was teaching about, even though I was not a Muslim then, you know. Um, 
what, and that's how I I met uh, the teachings of the Army Elijah Muhammad. What was the backlash like? Because in that environment, it's Christian minded people. Christianity yeah. is the dominant mm-hmm. ideology. So how did people respond to you when you said you were interested or joining the the nation of Islam? Well, at that time, you know. One of the things that white people in their media has been able to do is to make us resistant to resistance. Okay, we don't want that. We don't want anything different. We want to hold on to what we have. And we tend to believe that the white people lied to us about everything but God. But they lied about that too. They lied about everything in order to control us and uh, keep us subservient to them. And so I I didn't uh, have as much problem, believe it or not, about saying that I'm into Islam, I'm you know involved with that, as I did about announcing to everybody that I wasn't eating pork no more. That was, that was the problem. Okay, yo, oh, you can stop doing anything, but once you start telling some other Negroes you don't eat hog no more, oh, you're gonna have a real problem because we have been uh, taught to be addicted to that. We think eating pork is part of our cultural background. That's why we serve it at barbecues and we make eating chitlins a big festival and all kind of nonsense. We don't even know that there's a difference between pork and ham. We think that it's uh, two different things and it's not, but this is the confusion. And I remember Army Elijah Muhammad teaching once that if uh, you didn't buy it, they'd give it to you free. And they're doing that today. They're giving it to all the people in the shelters, all of the people that go to the pantries. They're giving it away free. And I said, mm, look at that. They're doing exactly what he taught. And so uh, that was where my problem came from. And, of course, my mother was a great Christian. And then I had met a wonderful, beautiful brother who ended up being my mentor and teacher, uh, Brother Solomon Ali, who was my first husband. And uh, he... Uh, was teaching me, he was teaching me. You know, we don't have, actually contrary to what people say, we don't have no women and no men different teachings in regard to the studies of Islam. Okay, not behavior, but in regard to the studies of Islam. And so he was teaching me that day and night, that's true. And uh, I, was, I was getting it, I was getting it. And uh, my mother didn't like him, of course, because he had brought me a new idea, you know. And hey, he and my father got along. <laughs> That's interesting. Was your was your father deep in Christianity like your mother? Uh, he wasn't really into anything that I ever saw him kind of do in that way, but he was interested in Islam. And then he died. Another, I have one more person I want to speak about that uh, history seems to have, have forgotten about. Noble Drew Ali. Mm-hmm. Can you share some of the great things in his influence on the nation of Islam? Uh, I don't know what kind of influence he had on it. A lot of the brothers back then were in the Savior's class. And so a lot of them heard information. Uh, Dad of Grace, a lot of different people, you know, were listening to what he taught because uh, the teachings that uh, the Iron Elijah Muhammad brought us are called the Supreme Wisdom because there's nothing over that. You know, I've sat in the room with doctors and lawyers and PhDs and everything you can imagine, but I can hold my own. I don't have a doctorate. I don't have a a law degree. I don't have a PhD, but I have what he told us was the supreme wisdom. So I'm able to dialogue with them and surpass the little knowledge that they have because most of the knowledge that we have comes from out of the white man's head and out of his books. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> what were some of the books uh, you guys were reading back then? That we were reading back then? Yeah. Uh, we read Message to the Black Man, but prior to that, we just had uh, information of uh, where the messenger had written in newspapers, or you'd go to a temple and hear that local minister teach and so forth. But uh, other than the Kawan, I don't remember any of the books that he gave us to read. He's, he told us about books. Yeah. Oh, there are hundreds and thousands of different books. And he told us about books that were in the Library of Congress that many of us that we needed to read and so forth. But I don't know anybody who ever did that, but we did get our information from him. And then, of course, after Message to the Black Man came out, then we were really able you know, to have it all in one place where we could study that. How big was it when that book came out? Sir? How big was it when that book came out? How big was the book? It, no, how big was it in regards to the response of the people? Oh, f- please. It's still Huge. changing lives to this day, you know? Huge. And uh, 
then of course we had uh, How to Eat to Live, book one and book two, The Fall of America, which I recommend everyone in America read, The Fall of America, and uh, Our Savior Has Arrived. You know, and every year at Savior's Day, he would give everyone a, a free book, one of his books. That's well, why I didn't know he gave out free books. Like that. As a souvenir, and uh, he would bless us with that. And it wasn't as uh, exorbitant as things are now when you go to Savior's Day, you got to have thousands of dollars almost, you know, because uh, times have changed and the people that's pimping this line is asking for more money. <laughs> A lot of the things that Dharma Elijah Muhammad taught back then were rejected, mocked, and ridiculed, okay? He taught us about fasting. So what are they recommending that people do today? Fast. What are they recommending? Stop eating so much, eat one meal a day, okay? Don't eat meat, okay? And he had the same problem with the schools. You know, he was jailed by the enemy because he would refuse to send his children to the white people's public schools which has destroyed our children. We the only people on the earth who send their children to the enemy to educate them. That hasn't worked for us or for our children. And so he said that the children need to be boys and girls in separate classes. He said they need to wear uniforms. Yeah, yes. He said, uh, and they need to be homeschooled. Those are the three most popular things in America today. That's what people are doing. They're turning more and more to homeschooling. It's uh, 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 actually more now, they're saying, than in the public schools because the public education has failed. The purpose of education is to civilize a people. But if you are not taught the principles that teach you and guide you into civilization, it's just a, a, another process that they use to keep a job and insurance and everything for their families because it has not benefited us. And in the past 20 years, it's gotten worse and worse and so forth. But all of the things that he has taught about have come around to be what makes the most sense, scientifically proven to be effective, has been his teachings. People are doing it now, but they don't give him credit. The only reason the Army Elijah Muhammad never got the credit and the recognition and the belief that he deserved is because he taught that the white man is a devil, so that meant that the white woman was too, and black men and black women were not going to accept that part. Oh, they might have stopped smoking, they might have stopped eating pork, but when you start talking about you gotta stay away from the enemy and do something for yourself, nobody wanted that, and that's even similar to today. Well, everybody knows that I'm a believer in the teachings that are Elijah Muhammad. Not Minister Farrakhan, not any of those other people out there that's trying to give their idea and who have changed his teachings. When he had told us explicitly, if Allah should take me and I should die, that does not mean that what I have taught you is false. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. All right? But many of our people, as I said, all that adoration and clapping and applause and jumping up, you have to be very careful with that because it is such an ego boost and it is such a thrill that you start to really believe it. Boy, I must be great. I am great. Okay? And you can't take that for yourself. Mr. Farrakhan shouldn't have took it for himself because it didn't belong to him to go in and start changing the teachings around based on his limited understanding of what the messenger taught. Okay, so that was wrong to do that. And so as a result of that, we do have Muslims in America today, but the Muslims are not known for a certain kind of progress. They're known for dressing a certain way or selling a bean pie or wearing a bow tie and, and uh, uh, attending a temple and doing things like that. But the principles that he taught us about raising our children, he had the only religion that taught you something about raising your children. All the other religions just teach you about Jesus. And they teach you about whatever their concept is about a supreme being. But they don't teach you how to rear your children. They don't teach you how to eat in your home. See, the messenger didn't give us a religion. He gave us a way of life. It has been the most wonderful thing for me. I am into the fourth generation. I have a great grandson that's two and a half, and he say, I salam alaikum. Okay? So, you know, this is, I believe this. A mother will not teach her child something she does not believe. All right? So that's why a lot of our children are running wild, because you can get into certain religions, even the 
Arab religion in the East. You can get into those and they'll give you a lot of different activities, rituals, costumes. They give you all of that. But they don't work as hard to make you straighten yourself up. The messenger said the temple I'm asking you to clean up and make ready is your own, yourself. And uh, the, the, the See, now you done got me started. No, no. That's not what I... <laughs> no, the, the thing though, um, another aspect too I, have to see, I think why people wouldn't want to go there is a thing called accountability. You're asked to do something with yourself and improve compared to Christianity where you're looking outside of yourself for someone to do something for you. So I think that's another reason it kind of deterred people from the teachings of Elijah Muhammad because it's accountability. Well, of course, that's what I had said earlier. You know, uh, we don't want to have to deal with self. We are so sensitive because we too, all of us have low self-esteem. You know, the uh, greatness of you has been repressed. You know, the entire history we've been here. And I say all the time, it took us five or six hundred years to get in this condition. It might take us five or six hundred more to get out if the civilization lasts that long, you know, and that, that's debatable too. But uh, we have been taught to be dependent. He is the only one that taught us that profit was better than wages. You can't get rich working by the hour. You can sustain yourself, but that system is one designed to have you go and work for the enemy get paid for it, and then give it right back to him. There's no stop in between that for you to do something for yourself, even though we think getting clothes and a car and a house or something is doing something for ourselves. But that's very limited, that's very small, and it does not uh, allow us to benefit from the greatness that we have and the creativity and the knowledge and just the pure goodness and righteousness that we have in us that has been camouflaged by the nonsense that the enemy has taught us. And so not everybody on earth think we are fool. What is required at the individual, family, and community level for black Americans to eradicate the racial wealth gap that is prevalent in the U.S. and hence improve their health and social outcomes? Nothing. There's nothing we can do about their condition. We can't even do nothing about our condition. Yeah, I, uh, we say that uh, as black women that we know how to raise a son, we can raise a boy, we can maintain him and grow him up and feed him and all of that. But we can't make no man. Look at our girls and they just like us. We all females and look at their condition. We can't make them, not with the same information that's out there. We need our men to start taking more uh, charge of how their daughters are dressing, starting from a little girl. We need to uh, start having a better diet. We need to figure out how to eat better so that we don't keep reproducing people who have those basic diseases, you know, the high blood pressure and the diabetes. These things are killing us. Heart trouble, all of those things. Uh, that would change if we had a different diet, not a different medicine, just a different diet. And it's very difficult because they have so much food out here. But it's, it's more chemical now. The food is not getting better. We need to be learning how to cook, how to prepare, or grow at least one vegetable in a bucket. See, the further away you are away from your food source, the less important it seems to be to you. And those are the first people that get caught up in a famine because they don't have any food. We don't even know how to get food. I had my nephew once, I had my, my grandson and my nephew outside on the porch shucking corn, because I used to always try to keep them involved with the food process. And uh, Hassan, my grandson once said, uh, where did this corn come from, Grandma? And before I could answer, Ramses said, uh, what are you talking about, corn come out of can? <laughs> I was so hurt. He wasn't in my household, though, so, you know, Hassan, you know, uh -uh. Uh, Ramses lived with some Christians, his mom and daddy. And uh, he said, corn come out of can. I said, wait a minute. And then I had to go through, boy, that opened up a lesson. Oh, we dealt with that from the grocery store to the ground to us growing stuff in the backyard, which I had done, you know, before. But yeah, he was 14. He wasn't three. So many of our children don't. And then I once went in the, uh, uh, what's some chicken place, and uh, 
the girl was in there. I said, okay, we're going to get two wings and a leg. And she kept taking the chicken and turning it over and turning it over, different pieces. I said, what's the matter? I said, I wanted the crispy, you know, what we eat. <laughs> I said, what's, what's the problem? She said, I get mixed up. I don't know which is which. This is how it is out here. So you have to go around this country to really see if you've been out here. Once you get out of your shell at your house and your little neighborhood and see the condition that exists out here in America of our people. It's people living out here who still don't have a toilet. Black people don't have an indoor toilet. Some of them don't have a toilet at all. So we, as I said, we have not made a nation is judged by its worst examples. Based on that, we have not made the progress we think we have. And we're embarrassed of each other now. We see you out there looking bad, doing bad. Oh, that embarrasses me. This is how they have taught us to be. We got class distinction among the lowest class in the country. <laughs> it, it's just a terrible thing. But it's going to take some work. We're going to end up with forced unity. Okay. This not getting along, breaking up all the time, that's a luxury. That's going to end. A lot of things are going to change within the next 10 years. Uh, the, uh, they have never had, the enemy has never had a civilization that lasted over 200 and some odd years. We're past that. Past that, <laughs> past that a long time. Yeah. So, you know, something is coming. I'm here to tell you, you know, that things are going to start happening that we ain't going to have any control over. So it's best that what we do now is, uh, I was telling somebody too about the food shortage, and I said, you know, we're going to reach a point where there's going to be a famine and a food shortage here in America. And uh, I say, so what will you do? You're not putting up any food or anything. You're not saving no cans, no buckets, no nothing. And uh, this is a brother. He said, to be a food shortage, I'll just call down and have them raise my food stamps. See, we don't even make no sense. We, we just do, this was an adult. We just, we don't really even understand basic things about survival because they made us dependent, total dependence. And uh, the only thing we can hold on to is, as I said, we, we are going to be the winner. It may not look like it, but that's how it always looks for people in that, you know. And uh, where did the courage come from initially to step out and do the work that you did? Because you were getting a crazy fight. In At the first? 90s. Yeah, like a oh, crazy yeah. fight. Yeah. And where did the courage come from to continue not be discouraged? You don't see it like that. I didn't see it like that. Somebody asked me once, how does it feel to be up on stage in front of all those people or whatever? I say, it feels natural. It feels like this is how it should be. And that's how you know there'd be something in you. That God didn't send me. I sent me. Okay? I ain't saying that God do not need that, no help. History is going to play out. All right. Okay?